Welcome to Catch Outdoors. I'm your host, Captain Rob Modis. Contact email, catchoutdoors at gmail.com. My website's catchoutdoors.com. And my Facebook page is Catch Outdoors. Catch Outdoors presented by Waypoint at waypointtv.com. i got a couple of books available on Amazon Kindle, Bridge to Paradise. That's a book of short stories. And what I know about fishing Southwest Florida, that's labeled by readers as a great book to read if you want to learn about fishing the waters of Southwest Florida. Book three is in the works. This is episode 37, and the subject is Lake Okeechobee. For those who live in South Florida, Southwest Florida, we have a unique opportunity to fish one of the best freshwater lakes in the entire country. Lake Okeechobee, or Lake O as the locals refer to it. Um, vast. That's the first thing. I always think about this when I think of Lake Okeechobee. Vast, wide, huge. <laughs> the first time I looked upon it years ago, I did not, I just did not realize that there's no way in the world you're going to see the other side. I don't know. It's a lake. You know, you just think, there's a lake. Yeah. Well, no, it's huge. There's no way you're looking. It's like a, it kind of looks like a little ocean, you know, different color, but it covers 730 square miles, 33 miles from east to west and 30 miles from north to south. I had to look it up. That's, that's big, really big. However, that should keep anglers busy. <laughs> That's the way I always look at it. Okeechobee means big water in the Seminole Indian uh, language dialect. It's uh, Okeechobee is big water. When you stand on one of the shorelines or protective levees, the lake actually appears to be, as I said, an endless bay. It's, it's really breathtaking. Uh, it's, its size is a bit overwhelming. It's located south of Orlando roughly in between Fort Myers and West Palm Beach, north of the Everglades. Uh, it's connected to both the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean by a canal called the Okeechobee Waterway. It's a man-made canal, 152 miles long, by the way, speaking of size. It's got a series of locks to raise and lower boats as they move through it. I've, I've lived on both ends of it almost. I lived in Fort Myers, which is on the Caloosahatchee River end, which is then turns into the Okeechobee Waterway. It's part of the waterway. And on the other side, uh, you got to get up around uh, uh, ooh, Jupiter. I Don't hold me to that. It's been a while since I've been up on that end of it. Um, it runs the southern rim of the lake. It's, it's sort of an interesting channel. It does not run straight across Lake Okeechobee. So the waterway itself, actually, when you get over to Clewiston, it, it basically just cuts south. And it runs all the way around the south rim, which is you know part of the reason it's 152 miles long. It runs around the whole bottom half of the lake, but it also includes the water toward the west and the water toward the east. So... Um, but it was specifically designed as a waterway to move boats. It's um, it's 80 feet wide. Some places are 100 feet wide, but you have to you know figure that your boat cannot your boat or your barge or parcel cannot be larger than 80 feet across. Um, so, and I think that's probably due to the locks. I doubt that's the actual waterway problem. But anyway, I know the maximums around uh, uh, 80 for getting through it. If you wish to move a boat from one coast to the other and make it easy on yourself, that's where the Okeechobee Waterway really comes in. I've moved a few boats around, more than a few boats, around Florida. So, you know, if you if you want to take a boat from the East Coast to the West Coast, a good-sized boat, uh, and it doesn't draw more than about eight feet of water because that's the canal's depth is, is at eight feet, roughly eight feet, um, then you're going to have to take it around the tip of Florida. And if it's larger than that or, or draws more water than that, so then you're going to say you're over here on this coast in Fort Lauderdale, you got to go all the way down to Biscayne Bay and around the Florida Keys, either outside or inside on the intercoastal waterway. North, after you get out to about a little past Isla Mirada, down toward Marathon, you turn north, and you head pretty much due north in the Gulf of Mexico until you deliver that boat, uh, you know, Naples, Fort Myers, uh, Clearwater, wherever it is you're going. The way across Florida is shorter. And, and when it comes to weather and waves, just it's less treacherous. Um, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a totally 
intercoastal canal system. So um, the lake itself, however, is navigable, but only by the experienced boater. I would not recommend anybody going across that lake without knowing what you're doing. The entire depth, average depth, of Lake Okeechobee is five feet deep. So there are places that are deeper and there are places that are a whole lot shallower and there's places full of rocks and boulders and it's just bad. Um, it reminds me very much of trying to boat out of the Homosassa River. There's another place that's on the that's on the west coast of Florida where I would highly suggest a guide of some time the first few times you go through it because um, there are boulders there that just rip the out drive right off a boat. Uh, or at, at the very least mess up your prop. Okeechobee is the same way, just much, much larger. So getting around in the lake is is kind of a, a real trick. It can be te- treacherous if you don't know what you're doing because of the shallowness and, and the rocks and things. Fishing is a way of life on that lake. I mean, that's pretty much what people do is fish the lake. Um, they do draw some bait out of it, shiners, things like that. Um, alligator hunts happen there. As far as I know, they do. I've, I haven't asked anybody, but I assume that the alligator hunting goes on because you're not in the Everglades National Park. I'm not sure how permits work. Well, I do know you need a permit to alligator hunt, and they're, and they're only select a few each year. But that's about it. Most of the time, this lake is fishing, 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 fishing. That's pretty much what they do. They A lot of bass. A lot of bass. There are crappie and other species in there, but bass is the focus. And getting on a, uh, a a trophy bass is pretty much what Okeechobee is all about to a, to a lot of people. Um, second biggest use for Lake Okeechobee is probably camping all around the rim, the outer edges of the lake, north, south, east, west. There are campsites, places to camp. Um, there's water access. Um, you know, you can you can shore fish. About the only thing I would not recommend doing uh, is swimming. <laughs> I mentioned it just a second ago. There's some of the most enormous alligators in there you've ever laid eyes on. Some I have seen some huge ones. And I am not overly fond of kayaking in there. Uh, I'll just mention that right up front. I'll probably touch on that again as we're talking about different fishing methods and things. But um, I just don't like sitting on the water when I know the size of the gators that are around. I would at least want to have a John Bow with maybe a little motor on the back of it, something just to give you a little freeboard. Um, but um, anyway, that's the downside, and it's not a huge downside. It's just you need to be aware of it and cautious of it. Fishing's complicated there. Um, I, I personally, and I've heard from downtrodden anglers, um, Talk about skunk days there. Uh, So I'm going to start with this. Hire a guide. At least do it the first few times you go out on the water and you attempt to fish the lake, especially from open water. If you're fishing from shoreline, stuff like that, you'll have to do your best to figure it out. I'll give you a hint. Soft plastics work really, really well. Anything that wiggles in the water that looks a little bit like a shiner, uh, something rubbery, certain times of years, frogs, lizards, worms things like that so it's it's like it's like almost any other bass lake in florida it's just it's just enormous um so those fish can move and they will move and so you can be in an area where there just aren't any fish for a while and then come back two weeks later and guess what they're there a little history first and then we'll do some more of this fishing stuff um scientists believe that lake okeechobee was formed about six thousand years ago when the ocean waters actually were covering southern Florida. And as they receded, this depression in the ocean bottom is what became Lake Okeechobee. Um, So essentially, it it has to do a lot with the shallowness of the lake. So you have to picture all of Florida covered up with water, and all of a sudden the water receded, and ta-da, you have this, this huge lake, second largest lake in the continental United States. Um interior we're not talking about the great lakes and that stuff the border lakes on canada but in the interior lakes it is the second largest interior lake so six thousand years ago it started let's see let's move way forward 1881 gentleman named hamilton diston he was a millionaire he bought uh four million acres i believe it was (laughs) of florida four million which included lake okeechobee and that's when the 
canaling and the uh, carving of the lake up started to happen, uh, mainly for agriculture. He started dredging the lake and draining some of the lake to create farms and communities um, around the lake. And so that was the first, that was the first, that was when that first started to happen. And then these catastrophic hurricanes showed up, as they do in Florida, and especially back then when there wasn't a whole lot of warning and the uh, weather services that we have now. So in 1926, and then almost, what is it, two years later, 28, um, catastrophic hurricanes killed hundreds, thousands of people that were living around the lake. And this damage prompted the government to step in and improve the water control structures uh, that protected the farms and the towns and things, especially on the south side of Lake Okeechobee. The devastation from the hurricanes and the loss of life is what prompted President Herbert Hoover to start building the Okeechobee Waterway, which was, again, a series of locks and canals and things around the south rim of the lake and other areas. And they started to build a giant berm, if you will, um, all around the edge to hold the lake in if it should flood or a hurricane would come to keep the water from washing out, washing south over the towns. And I believe it actually, there was a hurricane in 1947 uh, they refer to it as a, as a Lauderdale hurricane. The, the hurricanes before, they, know, they didn't have names. Um, that one managed to actually get over the top of the berm, dike, whatever you want to call it, and flood it out and kill people again. So they made it higher. So long story short, the, the, this, the thing that you see now, that berm that runs around the bottom side of the lake is, uh, you know, roughly was built, let's just say it was completed in 1950 or so when they, when they really got it in place. There have been a lot of issues about that, and probably the biggest issue with, with me personally as a, as a fisher person or an outdoor person is um, I don't have a problem with agriculture because that's pretty much what they use the southern lands uh, uh, behind the lake for, and agriculture is a huge thing in Florida. But the environment's huge too, and so is fishing. And the biggest problem that the berm does is it, it, it kind of it just doesn't let enough water to go south into the Everglades. Now, over time, this is being adjusted, and over time, there's a lot of work being done. So I don't want to make it sound like nobody cares, because they do. And a lot of work is actually happening now to get some of that water um, out of Lake Okeechobee and to, and to move it south. And the reason for that is, for the longest time, the water, when it, would, when it would fill up, was pumped left and right. So in other words, the Army Corps of Engineers would let a lot of water go toward the west coast of Florida through the um, Caloosahatchee River side. And then on the other side, through the east side, out, out through um, the Treasure Coast, over toward uh, Indian River Lagoon. That's the word I was looking for. So, mess of water goes east, mess of water goes west. East tends to be um, more dramatically affected by it because the water system over there is so much smaller than the Caloosahatchee. But over the last five or six or seven years, it got really bad on the Caloosahatchee side. Uh, things like red tide, algae blooms, all kinds of fun things because of the lake. So um, what they're doing now is they are trying to get that fixed. They're trying to get it so that the water will now move more south or it'll pond uh, and clear before it's sent out. You have to understand that this water's got all kinds of fun stuff in it because, it's, I mean, it's close to farming and things. There's insecticides and things like that in the lake, and you don't want that in your water system. Um, so it's kind of a dilemma. Uh, and unfortunately, that's just the way it is. Uh, hopefully, this will happen over over time. It'll get better and better, and they'll start to move more and more water into uh, the Everglades and down into Florida Bay, which which sorely needs that water right now. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, fishing there can be tough for the for the novice, and I don't mean a person who I don't talk about something never fishes. I'm talking people that fish a lot. <laughs> the lake can be puzzling because there's a lot going on there uh, and especially at certain times of the year you know it's it's like any other lake it's just it's just mammoth so think fishing guide um, get a good guide work the lake with a guide maybe two or three times especially if you plan on visiting regularly or maybe you're moving to the area maybe you're moving to one of the towns around the lake and you really want to get into it um, those of us that live on either east or west coast it's only a short drive to get to Lake Okeechobee on the east side about an hour on the west side maybe 90 minutes just to get to Lake Okeechobee and fish it. So it's not it's not out of the question for some people just to pick up, load up the truck, in my case the Jeep, 
and head over to Okeechobee and do a little fishing. But it's, it is tough. I'm not going to kid you. It's better with a guide. Now, on that note, my favorite guide in Lake Okeechobee is Captain Mark King. And I gave him a call the other day. I said, you know, I'm going to do this podcast about the lake. And I've got some detail that I'd like to share about fishing it. Um, so the first thing I told him on the phone was, I'm not here to give away secrets, but what I really want you to do is just give us a, a, some general information about it. Mark fishes out of Clewiston, which is on the lower west side of the lake, he guides out of the Roland and Marianne Martin's Marina and Resort. Um, I asked you if you'd be kind enough to, to share some information. You know, like I don't want him to get terribly specific. I don't want to give away all of his secrets. <laughs> Go fishing with him. Um Equipment's fairly standard, he said. Most anglers use bait casts and rods and reels. However, using a spin cast equipment isn't really frowned upon. Uh, I'm guessing that's because many saltwater anglers use the lake, as I said, from the west and the east coast, and they bring their own gear with them to Lake Okeechobee, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, Mark said, you know, in, in my case, in my past trips, I usually brought my spinning gear with me, and, and because it's simply I'm a lousy bait casting reel user. Uh, I'm not kidding. I can create more bird's nests than a springtime robin. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, and I didn't want to have to be picking that out of my reel or him picking it out of the reel while we're fishing. So it, it didn't, I mean, he told me, he says, I, he doesn't care what you use. He's, he's got equipment on the boat, but if you'd like to bring your spin stuff, you can. And he said, people use a lot of spin on the lake because of its, of its proximity to the east and west coast of Florida. Rods used on the lake are, are fairly standard, um, seven foot medium heavy, same thing I use for saltwater fishing, bait cast or spin, as I mentioned. Uh, He said, uh, not too many fishermen use uh, light tackle on Lake O. Uh, And I can tell you why, because I've seen some of the bass and I've seen some of the cover that they can get themselves in. So I kind of get that. It's a different world from salt where we use lighter tackle, lighter weight leaders and things like that. More of a finesse to get the fish to bite. Um, he said bass don't have a trouble biting when they're in the right place and you put a bait or a lure in the right place. So um, he uses both mono and braid, but without a leader. I found that interesting because we use leaders in saltwater, um, more to hide the bait from anything else. And also, if we're using a lighter fishing line, then we want a heavier leader to help protect it from bite-offs, cut-offs, rocks, things like that. He's not doing that. In braid, he uses 50-pound test. I use eight. (laughs) In mono, he uses 30-pound test. If I were doing mono in saltwater, I'd be using probably 10 with a fluorocarbon 30-pound liter. So just to kind of give you an idea of what's going on there. He said bass in Lake O don't seem to be that terribly leader shy. Um, They also tolerate a lot of noise, which is unusual for lakes. He said most lakes you go into, you had better be quiet. Trolling motors can disturb them, can push them away from areas. And he says, of course, the outboard will. But he said, overall, the general noise level of people talking, casting stuff doesn't really seem to affect the the bass in the lake that much. He's, he said it's a huge area, and he thinks they're just used to having the boats and things cruising around, especially from large tournaments and things like that. So the fish are kind of seasoned to it, if you will. His reasoning for the switch between braid and mono I found really interesting um, and something that I don't do in salt that I may consider doing now. Braided line floats and mono sinks. So when you have braided line on the water and you have a breeze, the line's going to bow. So, for example, he, he says, you know, if I'm going to, he says, if I'm using live bait, if I'm going to put a shiner on there, which is very typical in Lake Okeechobee during certain times of the year, um, I want that shiner to stay in place. When I cast it into an area that I want it in, I want it to be there. If the wind is blowing and you have braid on, the braid is going to um, bellow or belly, and it's going to move across the water and pull your bait right out of the location that you're trying to hit. Mono, on the other hand, sinks. So if you're using monofilament and you throw it, it's going to sink and keep the bait right where you want it. So sum it up. Mono for live bait braid for artificials he does like the braid for artificials the floating of it is not a problem at that point because it's kind of a cast and retrieve and at the same time you will get a longer cast out of braid typically than you will out of monofilament there's there's less less friction with braid so it, it tends to cast further after hearing this i've decided to change my ways in salt 
<laughs> if I'm fishing live bait, I don't do it that often, but I do do it. I like to fish uh, threadfin herrings, uh, you know, things like that. Swimmy baits, uh, especially in the spring and summer, uh, when we catch those baits out in the out in the Gulf or in the or in the Atlantic, and uh, hook them up on like just a plain circle hook and start casting it into a known fish area, like underneath mangrove, something like that. With a breeze blowing, I am I may have to reconsider and and step back to monofilament for that type of fishing. So I found that I found that philosophy really interesting. I asked him about his go-to artificial. I said, you know, if you had one, only one that you could keep forever in a bag, and and that's all you ever got, you know, what what would it be? And he stopped for a moment to think, but then he came up with the Gambler Ace and. That's a soft plastic. Um, it's if you're familiar with Cinco's, it's very similar to the Cinco. But I, having having owned both, it's a little heavier, um, but it's shaped sort of the same way. Um, it, it's a it, the Cinco rigs are extremely popular now in Florida at all lakes, and putting a Cinco on is just not that unusual. If you're not sure about what that is, it's a it's kind of a strange rig. Look it up. Take a good look at it. It's hard to describe or show you on a podcast, but essentially when you're playing around with Cinco's, most of the time you're literally hooking the bait in the middle of the bait, not at the head like you would typically hook a, a soft plastic, a worm, something like that. It's very effective when it's cast into the water, typically weightless or with a, Cinco, a special Cinco hook with a tiny weight on it. It will actually uh, wave, you know, picture a leaf in the wind it'll do that in the water it'll just basically you know float back and forth as it floats down and i gotta be honest with you bass absolutely love that action so that was his that's his deal the gambler ace i said okay so now give me colors and he he didn't even hesitate june bug or black and blue june bug um i'm familiar with that i fish a lot of june bug june bug is an extremely popular color in florida and freshwater um and it's and it's Every single manufacturer is going to, is crazy if they don't offer that color or some variation of it. I personally also like watermelon. The watermelon's got a little more red in it, and reddish green in it, but it's still kind of the same idea as a June bug. It's a shiny, I don't know, odd color. Black and blue, however, surprised me, and I asked him about that, and he said, well, this past year, this past spring, it was just working better. And he really didn't know why, because he said it just it just did. And he... he does something that I do when fishing. He makes sure that that the boat, um, you're fishing a couple of anglers or you're fishing with a friend. Don't use the same thing. In his case, he's lucky because, you know, as I was, when you're a guide, you simply rig up two different things for the two different or three different people, three different things, and you have them cast, and suddenly one of them is going to be ahead of the other two or the other one. And the other one's going to be staring at the other guy and going, can I have one of those looking at you? You know, it's, it's one of those deals. And um, so the experimentation, if you will, happens rather quickly. You start to learn real fast what the fish are after. In this case, he said black and blue just worked better. So there you go. Um, tested <laughs> on Lake Okeechobee. I then asked him about water quality and, and clarity because I mentioned that earlier. The lake's been having some issues with that. Some of it stems from the water draining and the problems that they're running into, which they are fixing, fortunately. But it also runs into a lot of spraying is going on to kill invasive plants around the edges of the lake, which unfortunately are killing some of the lake's natural uh, far, uh, flora, if you will, uh, growth. And it's, it's, really, it's really a problem. Um, what we're running into now is... is uh, the grasses start to die because they're being sprayed on the edge, which creeps to the water. When you lose grass in a lake, you lose filtration. It's it's pretty simple. It also you also lose some oxygen, of course, but you lose filtration. Most plants that are in the water through their root systems or the little undersides of leaves and and things like that, they little cilia, they actually filter water. And so the lake is getting a little cloudier than it used to be. And I was disappointed to hear that. Um, but again, this gets back to that issue. Fishing's still been good, but it's a concern. And people are really, I'm glad they're starting to really pay attention to it. Um, this happened, I, I, I'm, I'm going to point this out while I'm thinking about this. This happened to a lake years ago over in Collier County, uh, Lake Trafford. Same sort of same sort of thing happened over there. 
um, hydrilla was just taken over the lake. Now, this is a much smaller lake than Lake Okeechobee, but still a hell of a bass lake. As a matter of fact, I believe it was on the tournament uh, track for quite a few years. Um, they started to spray the hydrilla to control the hydrilla. The hydrilla died and sank to the bottom. Everything was great for a few years, worked just fine, and then all of a sudden, the lake started to lose oxygen because the decaying debris on the bottom from the hydrilla was depleting the lake of oxygen and turning into a muck. What they used to spray the lake was a copper-based chemical. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but I know it had copper in it. Speaking from experience of doing saltwater aquariums, copper is used to treat sickness in fish, things like a thing called ick and stuff like that. But after you use the copper, here, here's the deal with copper. Copper is a balancing act. When you put it in an aquarium, it could kill the fish if there's too much of it. The idea is to kill the bug that's getting the fish and then cleaning the tank, and you have to change the water out. You have to do a couple of pretty severe water changes to make sure the copper gets out because guess what? Once copper is added to water, it stays in water. It does not evaporate. On a grander scale, that's what happened at Lake Trafford. The copper stayed in the lake. The copper kept killing stuff. And pretty soon you had a lake with nothing in it but muck and alligators. It was, it was horrible. When my wife, Janelle, and I moved over to the West Coast 20 years ago, they were just starting to take care of Lake Trafford and basically fix it. It required draining down the lake. It required dredging up all that muck to get all that copper out of the water. Um, they replanted, they added fish, and 20 years later, guess what? Trafford's coming back. It's become a really good local hot spot in Collier County, which near Immokalee, that's where this is, on the West Coast. It's become a really good hot spot for fishing now because they figured out what they did wrong, and I hope to goodness they don't do it again. I don't mean to freak you out, but Okeechobee is kind of like that on a grander scale. I don't believe they're using copper to spray, but what they are doing is they're slowly killing off that plant life on the edge. And I honestly, this is a personal thing. I, I don't believe that's a great idea. I think there there has to be a better way to approach the, uh, the uh, plants and things on there that they're trying to remove from the lake. Now back to Mark. Thank you for tolerating that. And well, hopefully you learned something about what's going on with the uh, freshwater lakes here in Florida. What time of year, I asked him. What's best? When should people be there? When do they go? Quickly answered, November through May. Spawn is in February through March. So the water stays cooler until late May. So in other words, you get there in November, the fishing is really pretty good. December is good, January is good, and then February is when the spawn starts. Now, I know that's those of you listening up north right now are going, seriously? <laughs> yes, seriously. February here is when things start to warm up. When days get longer and the fish get pretty crazy. And, and it's, it's true in salt and it's also true in, in the uh, freshwater environment. So February through March is your spawn. Um, at that point, when it warms up, so when you start to get to May, like you get right now, and this is, this is June. Um, when you get to June, you start throwing artificials. In the wintertime, you throw a lot of shiners. The fish are the fish want they just they want to get fattened up. They want to you know they're they're just they're interested in eating as much as possible when the spawn's getting ready to happen. So they fatten up during spawn. It's much easier to catch. It, basically, Mark described it like this: the fish bunch up, they they school, they gather for this event, and and they do that during a good portion of the winter. When May comes along, they start to scatter, and they become much harder to find. So. If you're throwing artificials, um, that's that's not a problem really, but you're better off doing shiners in the winter. The artificials, on the other hand, are better in the summer because it's that seek, search, destroy kind of mentality. What you're doing is casting. You're fan casting. You're looking for fish, and so you're working the bait constantly over a large area. And that makes a big, big difference in the summer. If you if you go over there in the summer and you just try to drop a shiner, and they may not be a fish within a mile of you. Throwing an artificial around will at least tell you where those fish are located and help you pinpoint uh, more about it. And, and when I say artificial, getting back to the Cinco's that Mark mentioned, I also use lizards, worms, frogs. Oh, I love using frogs, especially in the summertime over lily pads. Oh my gosh, there's nothing much more fun than a frog getting blasted by a bass. So uh, keep all that in mind. I mean, it's really, really important to fish in Okeechobee to understand how it works uh, seasonally.
Speaking of searching for him in the summer, I remember a trip with him several years back when we used Bill Lewis rattle traps. And those of you that we use rattle traps in salt too, by the way, Sa- same reason. You can cast them a mile. Uh, they're great for hitting schools of fish that are in the Gulf of Mexico that were running away from you, like Spanish mackerel and uh, uh, you know any any crate like bonita things that hit surface and run like you know fast moving fish because you can really really cast the things. Same thing in Okeechobee. It was it was a search tool. He was putting them on to search with them. So uh, I always like to point that out. And 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 while I'm at it, point out the fact that a lot of freshwater lures that are real popular in fresh work extremely well in salt water. The rattle traps also gave us constant action, which I really like. Um, we caught a bunch of bass using those things. Nothing real big. Um, decent fish in the one to two pound range, but a lot of them. And I personally, I'm a constant action person, and the and the rattle traps certainly provided that. Shore fish in the lake's possible, but kind of tough. There's there's there are parks around the lake. There are places you can go. Uh, there's an area uh, called Fish Eating Creek, which is on the west side of the lake. There's got there's parking, camping, all kinds of cool things there. There is some access through. <laughs> it's a pretty good ways away. You'll have to look at a map and see what I'm talking about. But there's uh, on the west, the extreme west of the lake. There's a I'll call it like a stream waterway system there uh, that leads into Fish Eating Creek, and fishing there is very very good. Um, that gives you some uh, on foot access. Again, gators. Watch out for gators. They'll even they have big signs up. I'm not the only one that freaks out about them. The the park services are really good about letting you know. Um, I mentioned kayaks. They work well. They do from shore, but you have to be aware again of the gators. I mean, it it's an issue, and you just have to mind your p's and q's and and kind of keep your head on a swivel to keep yourself out of trouble. Um, I'm not a huge fan of paddling the lake. Um, however, the fish eating creek area, the outpost there. They provide kayaks, canoes, and stuff like that. And in that area has, for some reason, far less gators than the rest of uh, Okeechobee that I, that I have visited. So in summary, go fishing. Check out Lake Okeechobee. It's really worth it. If you're a hardcore West Coast, East Coast saltwater fisher person, then you probably should get over there and take a look at Lake O. Lake O is, is I don't know, I've just always been intrigued by it. I mean, it's a very, very impressive place. And as I've said before, I, it's, the view is hard to beat. It really is. If you want to get a fi- to go fishing with Mark, you can find him at markkingfishing.com. He's a busy dude. Um, I, listen, if you're planning next season, now would be a time to start talking to him and consider some dates and things like that to get out there on the water. And when I say season, I'm talking about that winter time. Don't, I'm not saying you can't fish in the summer. You act- absolutely can. Uh, but some of the best fishing and some of the biggest bass are had in the, in the wintertime on the, on the lake O. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate you taking the time to tune in. If you enjoyed this podcast, please tell a friend and leave a review. My podcast is scheduled for each and every Tuesday. Catch you Outdoors is presented by Waypoint Podcast Network and is available on Waypoint and by many of your favorite podcast providers. Facebook page is Catch you Outdoors. The website is waypointtv.com and catchyoutdoors.com. Until next time, get outdoors and enjoy. <laughs>